Moving now to our next presentation, an ESL update, Mr. Kennedy. Good evening, President Johnson, Vice President Raglan, members of the board, Dr. Wise, and Mr. Garside. Um, my pleasure to be here tonight to <clears throat> give you an update on where we are as far as our EL programming goes for the 2020-2021 uh, school year. Uh, our first slide here, we like to lead off with this just to show that uh, numbers have grown steadily and um, increased quite a bit over the years. Uh, for this current school year, we currently sit at 3,404 identified English learners with another um, just under 1,800 students who have exited from our programs. So uh, all told about 5,200 students, about 25% of our district, um, a connection to um, English learning programs in the district. We're home right now to 84 different languages and dialects. Spanish by far is still the biggest. It's continued to be the, the most dominant of our language groups at about 71%. Somali, Arabic around 20%. That breaks down to about 12% Somali, about 8% Arabic. Ukraine had traditionally been our third largest uh, language group, but our Hakachin population has continued to grow uh, over the years, primarily on the in the western uh, region of our district. Um, and so that number is at 4%, probably moving closer to 5%, uh, which is you know, one of the areas that we'll talk about here in a moment that we've been able to address. Typically, um, we talked about newcomers the last time that we talked, and a newcomer student is someone who is first year or second year in US schools, or they still maintain that classification if they are performing at a pre-functional or beginner level, a one or a two on a one to five scale. Currently, 50.7% of the English learners in our district meet the state's requirements um, for being able to extend that satisfactory, unsatisfactory grading based on newcomer status. Um, so again, a little over 50% of our students, we're really working with those students as far as um, identifying a lot of basic needs that those students have. <clears throat> That's about a 6% increase these last couple of years. Based on that knowledge, um, it's nice that we work very closely with our curriculum department. And so uh, what we've really centered on the last two years um, through COVID crisis and all, we've really focused on intentionally trying to promote oral language skills for our students. We know that before our students can read and write, they have to be able to speak and listen. So we have really focused on those oral language domains for our students. And so uh, it, it's really been nice working with the curriculum department, working um, with our ELA folks, with a lot of the work that we're doing with Literacy Collaborative and with the Teachers College piece. We've really been able to work on um, generating ideas for writing um, for our students or a lot of oral and written discussion and really um, using issue walls, really talking with our kids. We'll do a read aloud. We'll talk about issues that might come up from a book. And then based on those issue walls, it really has been a great thing for us in helping our students have a path moving forward with writing. We, we follow the curriculum department's lead that if we have students who can write, we certainly have students who can read and comprehend. So that's been our intentional focus. <clears throat> Um, we were fortunate that we were selected as recipients of the Striving Readers Grant. This was the third year for us to be a part of the grant, working through our curriculum department. Uh, we worked in identifying our secondary students in both special education and the English language learning department. And so we were really able to use the money awarded through that Striving Reader Grant for a few things. We were able um, to really get some good job embedded training we were able to find really good digital resources that ended up being so important in this last year. Um, but we were really able to address a need for building classroom libraries. So we were able to use you know, over $100,000 of that money to help build classroom libraries at the secondary level um, as kind of an answer to the book rooms that you find um, more at the elementary and intermediate level. Um, but a lot of that work, that intentional work on building those libraries and those oral language skills, uh, we really saw a payoff with that. We saw an increase of 1.2 grade levels. Um, all of our ELs on average grades 7 to 12, they were really able um, 
to capitalize on those oral language skills. And it really helped as far as promoting reading level growth, grade level reading growth, a 1.2 grade level growth. And then a 5.4% increase in the number of our ELs who were scoring proficient or higher on state ELA tests. Now, again, with a high number of our students being identified as newcomers to still move over 5% of our kids forward as far as um, coming in at proficient or higher, we, we feel like um, a lot of progress was made as far as the work we were doing there. <clears throat> Go into the next slide. Our big thing, our big barometer as far as what we're doing um, for our students is of course the OELPA test, the Ohio English Language Proficiency Assessment. And so we've explained this before, but I like to try to remind folks that the state right now uses a one to three level to determine where students are. They're emerging, progressing, or proficient. And again, what the data shows us is that a small percentage of kids are emerging, a small percentage of kids are proficient, and everybody else is in the middle. So we still use that one to five composite scale when we talk about where our students are because we feel like it helps us to more accurately determine where those students are. So if we look at one to five scores on OELPA testing here on the next slide, sometimes it's easy. It looks like my arrows didn't line up completely correctly here in the transition, but sometimes when you get looking at these numbers, it's hard to figure out what are good numbers and bad numbers. So I attempted to use smiley faces to indicate that all the numbers we see here are positive numbers. Essentially, what you hope is you hope your students who are scoring at those lowest levels, emerging or progressing on the state's one to three calculus or pre-functional beginner on the, the scale that we use to more accurately describe where kids are. You want those numbers to decrease while you want the number of students scoring proficient on the one to three scale or intermediate advanced or proficient on the one to five scale. You want those numbers to increase. And so we saw a significant increase in those numbers from 2019 to 2020. And we've also seen a nice pattern from 2018 through 2020. We've seen essentially a decrease of about 4% of our students who are scoring in those lowest two uh, domain level scores, those lowest two proficiency ratings, and a corresponding 4 to 5% increase in students who are scoring at that um, advanced or proficient level. So for us, um, we, we feel like we're moving in the right direction as far as the work that we're doing. And we really do feel like the work we do with the curriculum department uh, has been beneficial for us in this time. Update on a couple of programs. We do a lot of work. Uh, we try to do a lot of work with every department in the district. We've been fortunate that we've been able to do a lot of work with our career tech department and Amy Shakat. And so there are two programs that we have spent a lot of uh, time. We've really been able to, to see great growth in these last few years. The one is the medical interpreter program um, through Ohio State. That medical interpreter program helps us to identify students who have strong heritage language Spanish skills. So those are students who are able to demonstrate some proficiency in reading and writing in their first language, as well as English. We've been able to identify those students we were able to get them into this program through Ohio State where they continue taking heritage Spanish courses to improve their Spanish writing and reading skills at the same time they're doing the same thing with English. Um, and then they also are, are able to take medical interpreting coursework through Ohio State. We currently have eight seniors completing um, their work this year. We have, I believe, 18 students that we have lined up to be a part of next year's cohort, which would be our biggest cohort yet. And so those students, in addition to the coursework they take for the district, they do work at Ohio State and they do work through uh, Doctors Hospital and Ohio Health as far as their medical interpreting program. Um, go ahead and go to that next one. The best thing for us on the medical interpreter program for the first time this year, that cohort of 18 that we're looking at, um, those are students from all four of our high schools. It started at Westland. We've grown it to Westland and Franklin Heights. And then this year, the building principals and the counselors were great in helping us get information out. And so we now have participants from all four high schools uh, who are lined up uh, for entry into the medical interpreter program, which again, we think is a great thing. 
In addition to that, um, the opportunities for these kids when they graduate, you know, our students right now, they've been accepted to, I believe there are seven different universities. Um, there are three kids on full scholarship at Ohio State and then a number of other universities throughout the state. Uh, they really have become an in-demand group. That heritage language piece, which is so important for what we're doing, um, that has also grown. So our heritage language program right now, those Spanish heritage language Spanish courses were only at Westland, then they were at Westland and Franklin Heights. Next year, they will be at Westland, Franklin Heights and Central Crossing. Um, so we have teachers at Central Crossing who are going through the training with Ohio State this coming year. It's a great indicator for success in a lot of fields, but it really capitalizes on opportunities for those students to uh, earn credits. The, the, the kids who already have oral language skills in their primary, their native language, and so this gives them an opportunity to really focus more on that reading and writing part um, in Spanish. We, through a partnership with Language Testing International this year, we've also been able, for the first time ever, to offer high school credits for students um, in languages that we don't offer in our schools. We just had two students who um, completed language testing through LTI, who both were able to earn three years worth of credit for Vietnamese based on their scores, um, and then our ability to transfer those into credit flex credits for those students. So always looking for opportunities to recognize the skills our students have coming in. And then our other program, the Bilingual Customer Service Program, uh, we've continued working with um, the Career Tech Department. Um, we have students at Westland High School and Franklin Heights High School. Um, Amy and I were able to go out and speak with students in all four of our high schools. And so we believe, again, we will have students from all four high schools who will participate in our bilingual customer service program. That's a partnership with Southwestern City Schools and Central New Mexico Community College. Uh, I think Amy will probably cover that a little bit later, but wonderful opportunities for our students there as far as career opportunities um, when they graduate. <clears throat> this year, one of the big areas that we've worked on is working with the Office of Civil Rights and working with um, folks from around the state to really make sure that we have a, um, a fully developed language assistance plan in place, not only for our students and staff in the district to, to try to help with any of the language needs we have, but really to focus on the needs of our families. Are we meeting the needs of our families in making sure that they have um, all the pertinent information they need for their students? So at the beginning of the year, we made sure that we sent something out to um, all of our buildings to make sure that our staff knew who, who is the bilingual assistant working in their building, what's the days they're in their building, and what's the best contact information, as well as information to a telephonic resource, Marty, that we use, just to make sure that people knew that we provide language assistance free of charge, and to make sure that they knew how to access someone if they needed interpreter support or translator support. We made sure this year that we put um, a language assistance plan notification in every building in the district. It's on the front page of our district website. It's on the front page of every building's website. It's in English, Spanish, and Somali because those are the three primary languages. Spanish and Somali are the, the two biggest languages that we need to address. So we provide this uh, language assistance plan notification in every building. It's on all the acrylic shields that are in buildings that are up at the front counters. And then we also have uh, acrylic stands that have those notices. And so we try to put those in any place where people are, any of the places where people are entering buildings so that our families are aware that um, those services are provided free of charge. We surveyed our staff, we surveyed our families. When we surveyed our staff, our staff said to us, yep, we're pretty aware of the fact that we offer services. Uh, I think we were anywhere from like an 87 to a 95% um, rate of awareness that we do offer services. And so we figured that we were in pretty good standing there. We really wanted to focus on our families. And what we found when we surveyed our families is that by and large, our families were aware of the fact that um, we do provide interpreter services at no charge and that um, key documents, any document that is pertinent or vital to a student's education is the language the Office of Civil Rights uses that we make sure that we translate those documents as well as any document 
that any family member requests. So if anyone comes in and makes a request to have something translated, every time we make sure those documents are translated. Where we found, what we found interesting was identifying for our families, making sure they know who their bilingual assistant is in their building, and then what's the best contact information. And so a lot of people had a good awareness of who their BA was, um, especially our Spanish speaking families, Somali families, that, that was a little bit more confusing. And then an email address, that seemed to be the area that we really, the survey showed we needed to address the most. So what we were able to do, you'll see in this next slide, we were able to create documents like you see here on the left that we pushed out to our building bilingual assistants that our building bilingual assistants were then able to push out to families saying in Spanish, Somali, and then in any of those buildings where Hakka Chin is that ever growing language base, we were able to push information out to those families saying, here's a picture of your BA, here's the phone number, here's the language they speak, and then here's the email address to contact them. We made sure that we sent that in Spanish, Somali, and again, Hakka Chin in the buildings where that was most needed. And really what it gave us a chance to do was this whole evaluation of our language assistance plan gave us a chance to sit down, look at what we were doing, recognize that there are, you know, that the folks in the Office of Civil Rights um, in conversation a couple of years ago told us they believe we do more than any district in the state of Ohio. They also believe that every district has opportunities to evaluate what you're doing and improve the services you're offering. And so, you know, we took that to heart. We, we like to look at what we're doing and see these are the areas we feel like we're strong in. These are the areas we feel like we need to address. And the evaluation really gave us an opportunity to do that, to make sure we're providing service for all the stakeholders in our community, our students, our staff, and our families. Community partnerships have been huge this past year. We have really relied on a lot of our community partners um, through this time of remote instruction, blended instruction, and now back to face-to-face -face instruction. We have really been able to focus on a lot of partnerships in the community. Um, they've been able to help us as far as identifying families who need services. They've been great to reach out to. When we have, have found out about families who might need support, um, it's just been a wonderful partnership to reach out to all these organizations to make sure that we are serving the needs of these students and families who really have demonstrated some significant needs at times in this past year. So without the community partnerships, um, you know, we're not able to accomplish nearly as many things as we need to accomplish in, in working with our students and families. And again, we're talking about 25% of the, of the families in our district have this EL connection. So um, these partnerships have definitely been vital. So really in a nutshell, the, the one thing I guess I didn't really get to, we were so excited. Um, this is the seventh year that we're continuing summer programming for our students. It's been great to be able to partner um, with our curriculum team, with Brian Bowser and Dr. Spain, uh, with Nicole Tayo with the special ed department. We are ready to go. We're identifying our students right now. We believe we're gonna be able to provide services for about 220 of our ELs um, in grades um, K to four, or I'm sorry, K to six this year that we've identified really are still showing some gaps in those students that we really need to provide support for. So um, it's wonderful to work for a district that really values um, the work that we do as far as providing services for our EL families. I say this everywhere, every time I go speak anywhere about the work that we do in the district, I'm fortunate that I work for a superintendent, that I work with the board of education, that I work with a curriculum team that from day one has always said, our EL families are a big part of how we do business in Southwestern city schools. And it's wonderful to be able to talk about the resources we offer. It's wonderful to work in the district um, where it is important every day to make sure that we are providing every opportunity for every student to learn. Having said that, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer at this time. Thank you. Um, Ed, first of all, I just want to say thank you so much. Um, this is, as you said, incredibly important work, and um, it, it cannot be understated the importance of your role. I, I do want to um, just ask a, a couple things in particular. First of all, the, the uh, Somali numbers were a little bit striking to me, that we still have quite a bit of work to do to even 
make that connection with with the families of who their uh, who their connection should be, and then also how to contact them. Um, what uh, what have been some of the things you've committed to change to kind of increase um, your your outreach and improve those numbers specifically for the Somali community? Yeah, I mean it's a, it's a <laughs> it's a great notice because it is it's a striking thing that jumps out at you. Part of, part of the issue that we have in our connection with our Somali community is um, that there is such a, a variance in translated documents, like a lot of the documents that we're able to push out for our Spanish speaking families. There's not always literacy in language one for any of our families, um, but in our Spanish speaking families, we find it to be a little bit more consistent in our Somali families because it's such a, a new language. It's only been a language since the 1970s. That's been a challenge for us um, in a lot of respects. So what we really have focused on and our Somali BAs have been wonderful with this um, we really have focused on th those personal contacts, picking up the phone and making a call to make sure that folks understand um, I'm the person who can help you. This is where you reach me. One of the challenges that we've had is because our Somali population, like our Spanish pop our Spanish speaking population has traditionally been more centered in a couple of different attendance areas in our district our Somali speaking community has been a little um, spread out a little bit more. And so what happens is um, we have Somali bilingual assistants who are covering more buildings in some cases because the numbers are not as high. Like there aren't, you know, some buildings will have 140 Spanish speaking students in a building and we'll have 30 Somali speaking students in one building, 15 in another, 22 in another. And so we're trying to really, what we've really committed to doing is working on making sure that we realign those resources so that we have as much consistent contact in a smaller attendance area as possible. And so it's a challenge, but it's something that, again, the data says to us, it's something that we, we really do need to address. And so um, we have found great success just in, in the amount of time that we've pushed this paperwork out or this, this information out to our families, we've seen a significant increase in our Somali population understanding this is who I call when I have questions. So it's a great question. Thank you so much. And actually your answer did uh, already answer my second question. So I just again wanna thank you for doing this important work. Absolutely, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kennedy. I look forward annually to your updates. Thank you very much.